Good evening, everyone. My name is Ken, um, Ken Ma. I came to Damasuka five years ago, and since then, every year, I came here about twice a year as a um, participant, and this is my very first time I'm up here talking at Damasuka. But um, I've been, you know, hosting global twin online groups on the Sundays. So hopefully I can see some of you at one point. Anyway, today we, I would like to go back to a very basis of the Buddhism and talk about uh, Four Noble Truth, Eightfold Path, and I will weave um, five khandhas through it. We talked about previous days, we talked about hindrances, we talked about jhana, so at least you know how to um, do the meditations with these two talks very well now. So let's come back to um, our very beginning. Why are we doing this? So this is the very first discourse of Buddha that I will be reading very soon. This is the very first discourse of Buddha he delivered in Itsipatthana, um, now called Sarath, near Baranati, India. And I've been learning Sutta quite a bit um, with my study and noticing his teaching style is he always started with the most important thing first. So any um, sutra, the, pay attention to what he say in a very few first paragraphs. Those are the most important. Especially this uh, Four Noble Truth is, we could even summarize as all of his 45 years of teaching in this sutta. You could say that and the foundation of Buddhism. So in this discourse, Buddha first talk about the issue and the causations of issues and what do we going to do with this and how are we going to do with this. So that's a lame time, right? So I'm reading for Samyutta Nikaya 56, 11. Now this bhikkhu is the noble truth of suffering. Birth is suffering, aging is suffering, illness is suffering, death is suffering, union with what is displeasing is suffering, separation from what is pleasing is suffering. Not to get what one wants is suffering, in brief, the five aggregates subject to clingings are suffering. Okay. So that's what Buddha said. So first thing, first challenge for us is understanding the word, actual pearly word of dukkha. We translate it as suffering. So in all of our translations, most of the time you will see a suffering or, you know, um, displeasing sometimes. The true Dukkha word is come from, um, if you look at the bullet card, there's a wheel and the XOR doesn't fit in properly. So what happened, it doesn't fit. The wheel and then XOR doesn't fit properly. It's a bumpy. That's what this actual meaning of it, right? So there is a many, many translation we can use, unsatisfying, unreliable, stressful. So I would say all of the above, right? So we have to understand the word dukkha and um, where is this dukkha coming from, right? All these unpleasantness coming from is another very important principle called impermanence, anicca, right? 
So it's been long before the Buddha, these are phenomenals that exist. None of these are permanent. None of you and I and you know anything else that we experience are permanent. So what Buddha discover all these phenomenals that we experience are based on condition. Okay? Conditioned and all conditioned things are impermanence. So everything causes by the previous causes and so on and so forth. So you will be learning all these in a few days when David go through the dependent originations um, uh, uh, discourse. Holding on to these things, anything, you, I will talk about the, these things pretty soon, are suffering because they are not permanent. You know, they come and go. And so what are the things? So I will read you about another uh, two sutta called five aggregates. What are the five aggregates? <coughs> all we have, all we have is mind and body. That's all we have. We don't have extra. So with the mind and body, they say five aggregates Buddha um, uh, uh, mold and split it out. You know, body is a form, as a form, and feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness, this four uh, aggregates as a mind. So that's all we have. Okay? So the next two sutta is about uh, five aggregates and clinging to these five aggregates cause some suffering. So this is Samyutta Nikaya 22.15. What is impermanent? As Savati, because form is impermanence. What is impermanence is suffering. What is suffering is non-self. What is non-self should be seen as it really with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine. This is I am not. This is not myself. So form is impermanence. So Buddha said anything that impermanence is non-self. What does that mean? Can I tell ourselves we are not going to grow old? We won't get any diseases? If it is a form, we should we could be able to do that. Can we do that? Yeah, we could exercise and we could eat healthy food. We could give a right condition to a little bit pro prolong. But can we keep it? Can we keep our form forever? Think about that. Feeling is impermanent. It's the same thing, right? Feeling is impermanent. What is impermanent is what impermanent is suffering. What is suffering is non-self. What is non-self should be seen as literally with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine. This is I'm not. This is not myself. So feeling. In Buddhist, Buddhism, the feeling is um, feeling good, bad, or neither good or bad. You know, this type of feeling. And they always say that you feel it. That's why it's called feeling, not too much of the emotional things. We can talk about it in a minute. Perception is impermanent. So what is perce perception? Perception is things that you remember, right? This is the color white. Someone told you that color white. That's what you remember is color white, that perception. Right? For a Burmese, this is not white. This is called a pew. Right? There you go. Totally different. Right? So, the perception itself is impermanence. Maybe white, maybe a, seems like a little bit permanent. But think about the times that you had some kind of memory 
in when you are five or ten years old, five or you know, like whatever, like in a childhood, are you really accurately say that these are stay correct? So they are not. Sometimes you remember it this way, sometimes you remember it that way. Can you really rely on it? Not, right? Because they come and go. Okay? Volitional formations are impermanent. What are the volitional formations? Sometimes translated as intentions, right? So any mental things out there can be volitional formations. So you, it could be your emotions, can be a volitional uh, uh, formation. So to, let's talk about emotions. Sometimes, why do we even meditate? Most of the time is our emotions are torturing us like crazy. That's why, right? In my case, that's, what, that's how I started. So are they permanent? One minute you are happy, next minute I don't even know where I am, you know. So really, I want really you to think through that as well, what we are reading here. Consciousness is impermanent. So yesterday you saw it in a Delson's um, our presentations and, and talked a lot about consciousness, you know, infinite consciousness. When you get to the point, you will experience all these individual consciousness are arising and passing away. Right now you see me, it's like a solid form. And you may not see me as a solid form. And what happened to Kin? You know, it's, she's flickering. <laughs> so... What is non-self should be seen really is with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Seeing thus, he understand there is no more for this state of being. Okay. So the next sutra set, 2216, what is suffering? As Savati, Bhikkhu, form is suffering. What is suffering is non-self. What is non-self should be seen as literally with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine, this is I'm not, this is not myself. Feeling is suffering, perception is suffering, volitional informations are suffering, consciousness is suffering. What suffering is non-self. What is non-self should be seen really is with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine, this is I'm not, this is not myself. Seeing thus, he understand there is no more for this state of being. This is the definitions of dukkha, right? So we just say that, okay, uh, feeling is impermanence and suffering feeling is impermanence and dukkha. Not everything, suffering, it's like, you know, a little bit rigid, right? Like the word, I'm not suffering, I'm in retreat right now. You know, it's far from suffering, right? But uh, is this day a dukkha? Yeah, I can see that in a lot of interview. You guys bring a lot of dukkha, right? Think about that, okay? So. So that's what Buddha meant by the first noble truth is suffering. Everything is suffering, but death, you know, everything else, all aggregates are suffering. All, all aggregates are, I rather say, dukkha. For me, it is the most important to understand the um, f first noble truth. So, you know, when you really think about it, right, like it's, it's even in a medical, if you don't know what kind of disease you have, or you, you don't even know that you have something, you have, you know, especially for women, you know, at a certain age, you have to scan the, you know, breast cancer, right? 
to find out the same thing with the first noble truth it's you don't even understand what is that how you're going to look for it some some a lot of the a lot of us are not even understanding not even awareing that we have the illness then what happened we don't try to cure it right so that's what this means second noble truth reading Now this bhikkhu is the noble truth of the origins of suffering. It is craving which lead to renewed existence, accompanied by delight and lust, seeking delights here and there, that is, craving for sensual pleasure, craving for existence, craving for extermination. Again, this is from a Samyutta Nikaya 5611, very first discourse of Buddha. He talked about second noble truth. Buddha point out the cause of the dukkha. Why do we have dukkha, right? And uh, this craving in Pali words called tana. You will hear it a lot from you know um, from a lot of the discourses. Again, you know, like it's this one-to-one -one translations from a Eastern language to Western language are a little bit harder. So I'm trying to break it down as much as, you know, I can. So Tana is like a, more like a craving than a more like a thirst. I want a little bit of more of this. I want a little bit more of that. So think about it just recently, even in your meditation, what happened? Ooh, I'm in second jhana. I want a little bit more of that. I'm hoping, you know, next sitting will be a third jhana. What happened next sitting? Uh, I don't know what happened to my meditations. Where's my metta go? You know, right? So you see the suffering and why are you suffer? From the beginning, I don't, let it happen. Whatever happened, let it happen. No attachment to the meditation itself. What happened? You might get a, a better chance of, you know, getting a um, nice and smooth meditation. Okay? And so does everything else in life. Right? It craving is a super sticky defilement. So to become the other day, yesterday, some one of you asked me, um, when you become arahant, what happened, right? What are we trying to do here? There's three defilement called uh, craving and self, idea of self, view of self, craving and um, ignorance. These three will be uprooted by you be, when you become an arhan. I'm not an arhan, so I don't know what this exactly feel like. But with my journey, I can tell you that every day, every retreat, every sitting, things are getting more clear, right? And all the things that I used to hang on to, I don't. I suffer less and less. I don't have less and less dukkha. So I can't even imagine when you become an arahant, what might happen, right? Your physical body is stay there. Pain is stay going to be there. What is the pain? Pain is something that you don't like. When you have pain, you want this thing to go away. You know, I have a headache. I want this to go away. I have to take Tylenol or something, you know. It's like trying to push it out, right? You realize that, okay, it's there. You know that it's not permanent. Eventually, it's going to drop. If you can bear it, bear with this. If you can't, go take a, um, a medication. Why are you making big deal about it? Why am I having this headache, right? That's the way I, I take on life right now. So. And even in a, um, in here Buddha said uh, uh, in this discourse, it's like a three different type of um, desire, craving or thirst, 
right? One of them is, um, the top one is a uh, sensual pleasure, right? It's cold, I want a jacket. I want a Canada Goose jacket, you know? It's not normal jacket, right? And uh, um, another way is like a, a desire to be better being. I don't want to, I think I've meditated enough, long enough. If I die, I want to go do a better wrong. I better go there, you know? And desire do not to exist, which is a, a little bit bad and negative, you know? I don't even want to live anymore. Like yesterday, I mentioned that this wanting and not wanting is the same, you know, uh, two sides of the same coin. So please identify and you just let go of that, right? You just relax into it, let go of this desire. That's what Sispande teach in Six Eyes all about. So third noble truth. Now this bhikkhu is the third. Now this bhikkhu is the noble truth of cessations of suffering. It is the reminderless fading away in cessations that same craving, the giving up, relinquishing of it, freedom from it, no reliance on it. So I told you yesterday, tips of the day. If you remember what. You have a craving. You have this, you know, like uh, uncomfortableness comes up. Or let's say, you know, like uh, you're searching for meta. Where did my meta go? Why is it go? Right? What happened? What do we do? We do six R. We six R not liking fact of it. Right? And I give. I told you when you do the six R every six R moment. Pay attention to it. At the end, a little mind is momentarily brightness comes. That's your third noble truth. You are experiencing a mundane Nibbana. Okay. So I love Buddhism is he talks about, if you study all these discourses, he tell he would tell he, he told you what's the problem and how to solve it. And in here the same thing. That's where the fourth noble truth comes in. He told you that dukkha, there's a dukkha. Why dukkha happen? Because of tana. With dukkha, uh, if you if you let go of the tana, that's where the niroda, which is the third noble truth, right? Uh, uh, cessations of these uh, dukkha is third noble truth. So he talks about these things. Does he tell us how? Of course he did. Fourth noble truth. Now this bhikkhu is the noble truth of the way leading to the cessations of suffering. It is this noble eightfold path. That is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right collectedness. This is a wonderful teaching, you know. So, so let's talk about this Eightfold Path. So, he told you what the problem is, now he will tell you how to solve this, okay. You can categorize a noble eightfold path in a three category. I always do that. You know, it's easier for me to grasp, right? There's a three factors. Some um, like Bhikkhu Body, I think he said it as a factors, or sometimes they even call it aggregates. But we have the five aggregates, so you know, I don't want to confuse people. So let's call it as a factors, right? So this three factors is wisdom factor, virtue factor, and meditation and or development factors, three categories. Wisdom factors has right view and right intention, okay? Virtue factor, 
Right speech, right action, right livelihood. Meditation, right effort, right mindfulness, and right collectedness. All right. So now I'm going to read from a Samyutta Nikaya 45.8. And what bhikkhu is right view, knowledge of suffering, or dukkha, knowledge of the origin of dukkha, knowledge of the cessations of dukkha, knowledge of the way leading to the cessations of dukkha. This is right view. So again, you know, we know what is the um, dukkha. We just discussed that a little bit about it. Okay. And I wanted to put a little bit more emphasis on a right view referring to Majjhima Nikaya number nine, but I'm not going to read that. So it's basically in Majjhima Nikaya number nine is saying, Understanding things are wholesome and unwholesome. That's the right view. Loving kindness is wholesome. Anger is not wholesome. If you know that, that's the right view. Okay. Understanding of nutriment. This is a little bit toughy one. If I have time, this is separately. We're going to do it at the end. This is really good for taking away home. Samyutta, if you don't, if I don't have time, can you, you know, please read through it. Samyutta Nikaya 4651 and talked about nutrients. You know, what makes these wholesome and unwholesome? And what are the food for these? It's, it's really wonderful because today I have quite a bit of stuff to go through. So I'll skip that. And understanding of Four Noble Truths. It's a right view, okay? Understanding of dependent origination or cause and effect is a right view. So we're going to learn that, you know, a little bit more detail, uh, dependent origination and transcendental dependent. Same thing, right? Buddha told you, you can expect that from Buddha, you know, problems and solutions. So we're going to go through that transcendent uh, dependent um, arising as well. So that's right view. I'm going to come back and tie th everything up a little bit later. Okay. I'm just going to, to let you know the um, definitions for now. Right intention. And what bhikkhu is right intention? Intention of renunciation intentions of no ill will, intention of harmlessness is called right intention. Again, this is Samyutta Nikaya 45.8. So why do you think right intention is important? Where is that, you know, what might cause the right intention? Right view, right? Right view come first. If you don't even have, this is a wholesome or unwholesome, how can you be here and you know, trying to send in loving kindness to some of our unpleasant accompanies, right? So, without the right intention, you won't go into the virtue, the next sections of uh, our Eightfold Path. So, what are these? Right speech. And what bhikkhu is right speech? Abstain from false speech, from divisive speech, from harsh speech, and from idle chatter. So, the, every morning we take the uh, um, recite, recitations of uh, eight precept, right? Like we are not going to, we will be abstaining from talking harsh speech or lies. But there's a two other two as well, right? Uh, devices speech like gossip okay and idle chatter like chit chat but they really don't like chit chat you know <laughs> like you can say like greeting stuff like that that's okay 
but sometimes these nonsense chatting away. That's including, guess what, in a social media too. These days, chattings are not just you and I talking. You know, I do not have any social media in my phone. I don't have Facebook or anything at all, like not even LinkedIn, you know, because I don't want to do that idle chatter because why this gives you a mind very busy. How do you know when you come to a meditation, you the whole day you chit chat about everything, who's doing Kim Kardashian's doing this and Kanye was run away with that and like all these nonsense stuff. Like when you meditating, you have to six out them like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. So what do we do? So this is, um, Delson's always use this acronym, tip for the day, right? Think, T-H-I-N-K. Is it timely? Is it honestly? Are you going to speak intentionally wholesome? Is it necessary to talk? Are you speaking kindly, right? So the other day I, to I told you guys, um, I use weight. Why am I talking? These are useful. Anyway, let's continue reading. Right actions. And what because is right action. Abstinence from destructions of life. Abstinence from dis taking what is not giving. Abstinence from sexual misconduct. This is called right action. So again, this is part of the precept that we took, right? Like as a lay people, we should take five precepts every morning, right? And uh, even if you forget, like before you go to bed. And uh, I have a, my really good friend, so um, had a, you know, preparation for death meditations in uh, one of the channel based on the five precept. Even your uh, friends or family that never ever come close to the Buddhism before they die if they take that precept because they can't break it anymore, right? Guess what? <laughs> Last intention, yeah? So another tips, all right? So, right actions is important. You know, think about it, destructions of life. If, yeah, if you kill a cow, it's very noticeable because it's, of course, it's, it's a lot bigger than you and give you a lot of trouble, but you can squash, uh, you know, bugs so easily. Should you do it? You know, because of, I don't like the way it look. They exist too, right? So, yeah, and another thing uh, uh, um, for Delson, he really stress is taking what is not giving, you know, what is taking not, what is not giving, not just a uh, cookies that roast bake, right? It's, um, think of it outside of the box, you know, in a team setting at work, you know, so-and-so supposed to do a lot of job. They deserve all these credits. Give it. Don't take it. It's not yours. Don't download the free downloads. That's not yours. It's, you know, although torrents, it's available, you know, I can download it. Artists has a lot of effort to put in it. Things like that. It it's, can go into very deep. So if you are going to keep the precept, five precept, think very carefully, right? So, so you know, and many, it, it's quite, quite serious task. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, people just say, oh, I don't kill, you know, I don't steal, you know, um, is it good enough, right? 
and uh, sexual misconduct. How many families and children do you know break up because of this? It's such a horrendous, you know, crime against human, I would say. Right? If you commit it to a partner, you can't commit it. You want to commit it to a 10 partner in the beginning. Well, if you have a consent, go for it. But, you know, hurting others, right? Intentionally hurting others. That's why these virtues are very important. Right livelihood. And what bhikkhus is right livelihood? Here, a noble disciple, having abandoned a wrong mode of livelihood, Earn his living by right livelihood. This is called right livelihood. Like you're dealing with the arms, you're dealing with the poisons, deal, you know, um, like of course, like killing and selling stuff, right? Like a human trafficking. I would even say animal trafficking, you know, like it's, it's, it's these all are wrong livelihood. But do you know that? any actor and actresses are wrong livelihood. Can you tell me why? Not yeah, they are lying. They are portraying something that they are not. So it, it was a very deep if you wanted to dig deep, you know, so. So these Three factors are virtue factors, right? Right effort, our favorite, my favorite at least. And what monks is right effort? There is the case where a monk generate a desire, endeavor, activate, persistent, uphold, and exert in his intent for sake of the non-arising evil unskillful quality that have not yet risen. He generate desire, endeavor, activate, persistent, uphold, and exert his intent for sake of abandonment of evil unskillful quality that haven't risen. He generate desire, endeavor, activate, persistent, uphold, and exert his intent for sake of the arising of skillful qualities that have not been arisen. He generates desire, endeavor, activate, persistent, uphold, exert in his intent for maintenance, non-confusion, increase, platitude, development, and accumulations of skillful quality that have arisen. This is, this monk is called right effort. Okay. <coughs> so let's try to break it with one day six hours. Recognize when the mind is distracted. What happened? All these unwholesome things rising up, right? You recognize that? And letting go of what unwholesome distractions so you abandon that, right? Relax into it. And bringing up a wholesome object, which is smile in our case. And return back to the object of meditation. Re-smiling. So bring the wholesome back. If an um, unwholesome thing comes up, abandon it, right? Bring back the wholesome things sustain and nurture the wholesome things, right? Staying on the loving kindness or your object of meditation, return and repeat the process. This is the, the right effort. And Delson once say, um, right effort is a, the, um, like backbone of four, I mean, eight noble, uh, eight, eightfold path. So right view leads it, but right efforts maintains it. That's how it works, okay? And we will get into two other uh, factors of 
um, develop you know factors of the, the development right mindfulness and what is right mindfulness here bhikkhu a bhikkhu dwell contemplating the body in the body ardent clearly comprehending mindful having removed confidence and displeasure in regard to the world he dwell contemplating feeling and feeling ardent clearly comprehending mindful having removed covetousness and displeasure in regards to the world he dwelt contemplating mind in mind ardent clearly comprehending mindful having removed covetousness and displeasure in regards to the world he dwelt contemplating phenomena in phenomena Arden, clearly comprehending, mindful, having removed covetousness and displeasure in regard to the world. This is called right mindfulness. Again, Samyutta Nikaya 45.8. To me, I uh, emphasize on having removed covetousness, displeasure in regard to the world, secluded, loving and kind. What are we doing? loving kindness right but although this one is go through with the full foundations of mindfulness like Siddhipatthana you know our sutra they all are related right you can take a look at it in a way that um, like ardent clearly comprehending mindful having revo- removed confidence and displeasure in regard to the world to me that sounds like a first jhana So let's, I wanted to discuss a little bit about relationship between right effort, 6R, and mindfulness, right? So yesterday, David uh, mentioned that as well, and um, in, in Delson's talks, Bande um, definitions, of the mindfulness, paying attention how your mind moves, right? And but mindfulness has this remembering notions in it. Sati, this is again, you know, like forgive me, um, I come from, uh, again, you know, Burmese speaking, you know, Asian language, right? So, so, so this is where the language, uh, a bit of the language pickle we, we get in here. Just like Divi said, it doesn't have a pure translation to English, you know. However, I would like to put like remember, and Delson definitions is remember to pay attention how your mind move. That's very close. Um, in Burmese language, we don't even use, um, I don't know how to say that sati into Burmese because we just use Pali. We don't translate because it cannot be translated, right? So this is a very close. So you are trying to Remember how your mind attention is moving from an object to, you know, this wholesome object to unwholesome object, then you do something, right? That something is a right effort. I have a question. Our teacher said the Samma Sati, which is right Sati. Yes. Is moment to moment awareness of the three, you know, Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. Well, that's say that you know people say that but if you wanted to really dig it down deeper you know it's not just that okay yes moment to moment awareness or remember to observe your mind attention is moving which is much more closer definitions that where i come from you know, um, are learning from a you know language, but again, I don't want to get into a language that much. I 
that's not my subject. So without the six R or right effort, your mind will be pulling away, you know, your sati will be gone. You, you will not know, you will not remember. And, but sati is a beautiful factors of mind, one of the factors of beautiful factors of mind. It's not always with the mind. It's come and go, you know, when it comes, it's, you know, it's it's always towards the wholesome. You will always remember, uh, oh, I'm supposed to be, you know, on the loving kindness. Now I am making a grocery list, right? Like this is not what I'm intend to do. So bring it back, right? So so that's 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 the portion of it that we link between the samasati and um, our, our right effort. Right effort and right mindfulness support each other to be a next level, next uh, 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 functions, right collectedness. So let me read that first and then I'll explain. Here bhikkhu, secluded from sensual pleasure, secluded from wholesome state, a bhikkhu enters and dwell in a first jhana, which is accompanied by thoughts and examination with rapture or pity and happiness born of seclusion. With the subsiding of thoughts and examination, he enter, dwell in a second jhana, which has internal confidence and unifications of mind, is without through thought and examination, and has rapture and happiness born of concentration or collectedness. With the fading away as well of rapture, he dwell equanimous and mindful and clearly comprehending. He experiences happiness with the body. He enter and dwells in the third jhana of which the noble ones declare. He is equanimous, mindful, one who dwells happily. With the abandoning of the pleasure and pain, and with the previous passing away of joy and displeasure, he entered the, and dwelt in fourth jhana, which is neither painful nor pleasant, and includes the purifications of mindfulness by equanimity. This is called right collectedness. So, this is sama samadhi, right? Bhikkhu develop samadhi, a bhikkhu who is collected understand things as they call are, and what does he understand? The arising and passing away of aggregates. I will explain this. So we go down to, from a right view, all the way to uh, our right collectedness, right? Why we do that? Anyone know? To see, yes, and what he understand, uh, the arising and passing away of aggregates. All right. So this is where the Great Forty Sutta, it's a, another MN one seventeen, a beautiful sutta. What is noble collectedness? What bhikkhu is noble right collectedness with its support and its requisite? That is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, and right mindfulness. Unification of mind equipped with these seven factors is called noble right collectedness with its supports and its requisite. So, the other seven factors support to samasamadhi or right collectedness according to this great 40 sutta right for me the way i look at it is not a linear this is this is me so take it with a grain of salt right 
not in linear, right view started, and then all these supporting each other without the right view, right intention won't come up. Without the right intention, you won't have the virtue. Without the virtue, you know, you can't meditate. Simple as that, right? So, so these are like a spiral upward, re re reinforcing to each other. And then, right, like it's just at the end, all these seven factors supporting to the noble collectedness. Why do we need noble collectedness? I'm going to read from Angutra Nikaya to 31. These two things play a part of realization. Realizations of what? Realizations of final destinations, liberations, you know? What to? Serenity and insight. What is the benefit of developing serenity? The mind is developed. What is the benefit of developing the mind? Greed or lust is giving up. What is the benefit of developing insight? Wisdom is developed. What is the benefit of developing wisdom? Ignorance is giving up. The mind contaminated by greed is not free. And wisdom contaminated by ignorance does not grow. In this way, freedom of heart comes from, or freedom of mind, you can say that like sometimes it's in poly interchange between heart and mind. Freedom of heart or mind come from the fading away of greed, while freedom by wisdom come from the fading away of ignorance. Remember, like I told you in the beginning, what are we trying to do? trying to eliminate the or uproot lust and greed oh, sorry lust and um, ignorance right but start with the right view any questions i'm on time i have a question about killing too so killing animals for food or just for taste but would that be ethical as per Buddha or no? Any killing is not ethical. <clears throat> but does Buddhist monks eat meat? Absolutely. Where that come from? In a you know uh, uh, Asian time, right? They can eat. Buddha allow the monks to eat anything given into their bowl. So depending on uh, 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 the persons, right? Like depending on uh, if you are in a poor villages, you might get veggies and rice, dal and rice, right? Like it's, it's, it's talking about India, right? Or uh, some, you know, people might uh, buy the meat from the market and then cook and, and give it to them. So as a monk, anything that coming from a bowl, you, 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 should not refuse it because you know people has a lot of thoughts and consideration into it but if as a monk you know people are killing it for you you are not allowed to eat so what about lay, people? lay people the same thing like how tightly precept you want to take it we can Go out and buy um, a meat and eat it. Why would you want to do? Okay, you know, I don't want this meat. I want to, you know, uh, um, have a chicken in in a, in a house and feeding, and then later on I'm going to kill it and eat it? No, right? You can always eat anything available out there. That's the whole idea about it. Right, so people, a lot of people argue. I always hear from the both side, right? Like it's a vegetarian, say, oh, why it's a Buddhist, you eat meat, you know. And to produce a vegetable, we are killing tens of millions of insects with this one spray, anyway, right? So 
because of your your empathy you are you don't want to eat cow but that's okay is it okay you eat you 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 kill many many maggots or any kinds of bugs you know to eat a, a produce right you could say it that way but yeah it's it's a you know eating meat or not meat is our preference but to kill to taste it absolutely no to kill for the pleasure right no people who are going fishing that's unethical of course it's a buddha's eye you don't know um there's a a few uh, dhammapada i don't know by heart it's um buddha saw kids are fishing and he just you know just order all these uh, little phrases are wonderful you know there's a, some stories behind it as well so Buddha never approved these type of things okay any questions It's a, we really have to be careful these days, you know, like innocently downloading a few stuff from the internet, right? Mm -hmm. Without permissions, you know, like, you know, looking through the news, some gossip about celebrity, of course, like always celebrity, right? Like, so, you know, who will gossip about me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so things like that. These these we really have to be careful. So yeah, like I said, this right speech is very deep. You know, so like depending on how you wanna take it, and eventually when your practice grow, they become tighter and tighter. But start with the basics, right? I won't kill. I won't kill a spider. I won't kill a you know, um, a bugs because of I don't like the way. You know, it's just at my house, um, observe, the kids and me always having a problem. They scare of spiders and they want me to kill it. And no, you know, I just have the little vacuum. You'd leave it outside, they will come back in. So what? <laughs> so they don't like that. And um, when uh, I'm in Hawaii right now, and one of the big thing in Hawaii is termite huge problem with the termite so as a renter I'm renting right now right um, but after I went through that renting process I decided not to buy in Hawaii as well um, as a renter you have to agree on the paper if you see a termite you have to let the landlord know so they can wipe that colony out I said I'm not going to sign it you remove it and they think I'm crazy you know so it is a very, quite difficult, yeah, but you know, yeah, what do you do? So, you know, I decided, um, yeah, so you stay in a, like some concrete, you know, condominium building and, <laughs> right, and yeah, things like that, so it's, um, but benefit of the taking five precepts, it's a very um, rewarding because you live the life without any regrets. Think about it, like you talk about your boss behind the boss back, right? Just a little bit, even complain. How many times you worry? Oh my goodness, is this person going to talk? And am I going to get in trouble? Maybe he did, and maybe that's why your performance reviews is sucks, you know, <laughs> but, right? So, I mean, without those things, mine is very clear. And, you know, lying, right? If you don't lie, it's like, you don't have to remember anything what you said. Mm -hmm. 
the benefit part of it. Mine is exceptionally clear. There's a, a few videos that Bundy and uh, Dalson has about hindrances and you know the the all like which hindrances tied into which precept you broke. So so reading newspapers, same thing. Idle chatter. It's important you know anyway. What is it so important? You know. Is um <clears throat> if you are having like a conversation with a friend, is that also considered idle chatter? Like if it's you know you sit down, you talk for a couple of hours, maybe you're talking about interesting things or like it's not just about the gossipy stuff. Is that also idle chatter? No, no. These are like important stuff that you need to communicate. Why not? Right. But uh, just always think. Always think, T H I N K, right? Is it necessary? If it is, sometimes it's necessary to break the silence and break the ice. You make it, you know, like so that people don't look at you very weird, and or you know, like uh, it's they will, um, they will, you know, uh, you can better relate it to them. Then, of course, that's not idle chatter. Idle chatter is it's one of the most biggest problems. I would say because of that, you know, um, all these kids these days has a lot of anxiety problem in our societies are coming from the idle chatter. So be careful. So we know about five aggregates because Next sessions are all linked, right? So that's why I just wanted to run down the very basics of Buddhism. No more question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll ask one more. Thank you. Um, so let's say you do these things, right? You are on the Eightfold Path and you, uh, you practice and um, you successfully abandon certain feathers to enter the stream. Um, in the next incarnation, will you remember that you successfully you know, let go of certain feathers? Or are you going to have... Because it seems that like, when you come into an incarnation, you forget. Or do you remember certain people? Is it just like... Like, no, I know that, you know, not my body. Yeah. But that's, I'm trying to figure out. Um, yeah. Yep. Know, Most of us forget, right? Most of us forget what is our past is, you know. But somehow these people, if you are born, um, if you die, and you became a Sarpana and you died, and next life, if you become a human, Somehow, although you are, might not be in a Buddhist community and stuff, I'm surprisingly see a few people that I get to know, they were born as a Sorpana, you know, and they are very tight in virtue. That's one of a very, um, you know, prominent feature of a Sorpana. They can't break five precepts. You can't intentionally break these precepts if you become a sorpana. Very tight. It's like it becomes automatic. So it's a really wonderful stage, you know, to be in. And we all shoot for, so you don't have to remember, did I break any precept, right? Like, it's this, you know, it's just... It's amazing. How do they come about? I don't know, you know. Um, but yeah, they were born with the inclination. I don't know, David, you might want to talk a little bit on it. I know a few. 
Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I have one more question about food. Sure. Uh, not only killing, but in general. So there's this Sabde Asava Sutta by Buddha in which he talks about patterns and everything. And he tells a story about nutriments, right? Yes. So mental nutriments and physical nutriments. Yes. And uh, the story goes, it's in the suttas, that uh, we, like everybody, all practitioners, so monks and otherwise, should treat food, food like, uh, so the story goes like there was a man, a woman, and the I child know that story, yeah. In the desert, right? So they had yeah. to eat their only child. Yes. So you should be eating any food that you're getting, you know, vegetarian meat, yes. whatever, as yes. it was your only food. So you should develop a little bit of disenchantment with food. I won't say disgust, but... Yes. Rather than relishing food and, you know, craving for certain kinds of food. And yeah. Things. Yeah. It's like, a, you know, in, in, in Burma, um, we were trained, if you go to the retreat center, you know, just like uh, in the morning, we do that of five recollections, right? And a little additional to it, it's like um, all the food that we are eating is just for the nutriment of our body not for beautifications of our body that's why we eat right and same thing with the clothing you know so those are coming right out of sutta yeah yeah that's the that's the 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 nutriment uh sutta that i was talking about it's a brilliant uh, it's sutta yeah just for the body, not yeah the so it's like you are eating the food as it just gives you nutriment that's it nothing more you know, sometimes what happened? This makes sense, though, when you really think about it. If if you, you, you know, overdo it, right? It's like your sensual craving. You know, that's why it's like um, when we go to the buffet. Oh my goodness, right? <laughs> right. Versus uh, if you go to a, you know, um, I was I was lucky enough to be. In India with Delson beginning of this year and you know we're taking he, he was towing us around and taking everywhere a really wonderful experience but some of the kids you know asking for food and at the meantime like so much waste and so much variety in I'm from Canada right it's the same you know Canadian <sighs> Uh, American, you know, it's so yeah. This is definitely something to think about. So, on a practical point of view, would it be okay to, for let's say, a couple of days a week, just have something very bland, like just oatmeal, nothing else? Yeah. Just to break your or, yep. Or you do a, um, you know, uh, uh, eight. Some people take the eight precept on certain days. Yeah, just to remind yourself, right? To me, I like the eight, you know, like uh, uh, eating, not eating after the noonday meal, particularly is so that I don't have to cook and I don't have to spend time in the kitchen. You know, this preparing, looking for food, preparing for food, when you really think about it, this just for food that people have to go to this extent of the effort is like, unbelievable you know so I'm not having a food aversion but at the same time stuff to think about is it worth it I'm spending hours in the cooking and preparing and not just preparing and you know you got to do a grocery even before they you know you have to have a money to you know like you have to why are we working full-time most of the time is for food on the table you know people got really nervous around it if foods are not there so I mean yeah something to think about but just moderate right like it's just, you don't need to go to super air you know one way or from one one end to the other end you know. yeah. what the are saying is that there's something called dopamine you know which is what is driving our social media and food if you have a, they, a dopamine fast, like you know, have very bland food and not check your phone for a whole day, yeah, have researched your dopamine system. Yeah. To be I have tips for the phone though. 
every time I only I make the determinations that that thing won't control me I control that thing okay so next time if your phone is buzzing you make that decision are you being controlled or not anybody can wait so you know just like anybody else my friends are like I can never catch you well I only reply the text messages from this time to this time that's it right I'm in a meeting or if I'm working my phone is there I'm always put my phone down I don't see it so I don't have crazy amount of you know buzzing coming in anyway I'm a bit rigid <laughs> All right. Okay. Sorry. Um, I have a job where um, I get calls like all day long. I'll be in my office. I get calls all day long, um, and I, I mean, I kind of have to take them. But it is it's very distracting. It distracts me from the things that I'm trying to do, or you know, wholesome states I'm <laughs> trying to be in. Do you have any recommendations for that type of situation where you can't exactly? I don't know, maybe I could find a way to have some kind of a system, but I haven't found it yet. Yeah, you just have to find a way and communicate it out. This is what you are doing. This is your system is, right? So that people don't expect it and mad at you. Mm -hmm. Even at work, I never reply my email right away. Like, it's horrible. Like, you know, there's a uh, emails coming, thing messages are coming you know and 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 people are calling you from phone which one do you answer first so you know what i block it you see my time i'm not answering anything i'm gonna work right so you gotta come up with the system and communicate it so once after you communicate it most of the people are okay All right but don't break your own rule right yeah every time someone calls you But actually, you know, as a way to uh, get in a wholesome state of mind before you enter a conversation. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Good. Do you oh. have time to read the Nutriment Sutta? Is it too long? Nutriment Sutta? Hang on. Uh, Nutriment Sutta itself is not that that long. Uh, 4651, let me see. Six. By the way, like if uh, anyone wants to know about these, you know, when I started I go out and buy all these sutta, but I don't even know how to look for things in here. Let me know. <laughs> what? What? You know, but yeah. Um, this one has a, oh yeah, this is a bit long. This, the one that I picked is a little bit long. Let's do on the last day. Okay. All right. It's just really good sutta we just you know in my global um online group we just break it down it took us three weeks to break it down <laughs> all right let's share merit may suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisitions of all kinds of happiness. May being inhibiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, everyone.